My name is uh, Toby Fife, and on behalf of the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada and its Ottawa chapter, I'd like to welcome you to this session of the 2012 National Education Series, Navigating the MS Maze. This is one of seven sessions taking place from coast to coast across Canada. We're sure that those of you here will be able to learn many insightful and practical ideas to help you, as individuals and families living with MS, to make better informed choices about MS treatments and symptom management. The MS Society gratefully acknowledges the support of Biogen EDEC for an unrestricted educational grant that makes this series possible. Please note that the MS Society of Canada is an independent, voluntary health agency and does not approve, endorse, or recommend any specific product or therapy, but provides information to assist individuals in making their own decisions. Most important, before we begin, we'd like to extend our thanks to those volunteers and the staff of the Ottawa chapter of the MS Society who have come here this evening and are making this session a great one. We'd also like to thank the staff at the National Office in Toronto who ensure a quality program at each and every event. Most of all, we'd like to thank all of you who have come this evening. I hope you find it has been a great investment of your time. So, the title of today's talk is uh, Navigating the MS Maze. And as it would suggest, there is much on the horizon globally and particularly within Canada in the area of MS. New therapies and treatments are being developed at a record pace. And so today what we wanted to do was focus on providing information on navigating these myriad options. Our expert panel will discuss current treatment options, what new therapies are being expected to be within the marketplace within the coming months. As well, where and how people impacted by MS can seek and obtain credible information to assist them in better managing their MS. This information, we hope, will help you to make more informed decisions on where we are currently in terms of MS care and what the future holds. I will ask, I've indicated that there is a form for you to write questions. We will be having a question and answer period, but after all three of the speakers. So I'll we'll ask you, we will then be passing around microphones in a, in a moderated way. So if you could hold your questions until after all three panelists, uh, I would appreciate it. You see our three panelists up there. I will be introducing them more formally each, as each one comes up. Uh, to give his or her presentation. Our first speaker is Dr. Mark Friedman. Dr. Friedman is a professor of medicine at the University of Ottawa and a neurologist at the Ottawa Hospital. He holds specialist certification in Quebec and is a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology. Dr. Friedman's research interests include molecular neurochemistry and cellular immunology. He is currently investigating immune mechanisms of damage and multiple sclerosis with particular interest in the role of gamma lead investigator, as a gamma lead investigator in the Canadian bone marrow transplant study on MS. Dr. Friedman has over 25 years experience managing patients with MS, has been the principal investigator on numerous clinical trials, and has over 200 publications and abstracts. He's active in committees of the MS Society of Canada, National MS Society in the US, and a consortium of MS centers. So Mark, my pleasure to have you up here. Thank you so much. So thank you very much. I look forward to sharing with you, unlike uh, previous years where we only would talk about things that were coming in the future and weren't sure if they would ever pan out. Um, the world is, is incredibly exciting now for uh, new treatments, uh, stemming from simple drugs to exotic monoclonal antibodies to even cell-based treatments. And, and uh, um, it it's, is moving at a dizzying space. Uh, and, and I'm going to try to touch on these, and I was afraid that uh, Maybe if, if we had a bit of the more lights out, because there's a lot of graphs and stuff, and I just don't think they're going to project. 
Uh, I don't want you to get caught up with numbers. Unfortunately, uh, this, these, some of these slides have come from a, a course I just gave last week at the American Academy. Uh, so there are a lot of numbers on them because it, to my colleagues, numbers are very important. The numbers reassure us that these trials are effective, that uh, we've eliminated any doubt that uh, the medications that I'm going to tell you about are working. So that needs to convince my colleagues and, and, uh, and people who are seeking treatments that what you're going to get is, is something that has been gone through rigorous trials. Uh, and, and I just want you to look at some of the, the, the curves because that's how uh, things are developed and, and that's how you, when you look at some of the information, should be looking at it and not trying to interpret how you're going to do, but interpret the study for what it is, which is uh, proving that, that something really is effective. So this I, I keep up updating and no you can't read it. Um, but if you look around the wheel, around the wheel are the different areas where medications are being developed based on our, our understanding of how MS moves around. I don't have a pointer, but uh, lymphocyte trafficking when, when the, the bad white blood cells of the body seek out to damage the central nervous system, they've got to get there somehow. And so they traffic through various ways. They go through arteries, veins, and the, what we call the lymphatic systems. And then they manage to get into the organ of interest, in this case, the central nervous system. So if you can block or hamper lymphocyte trafficking, you might be able to slow or even stop the disease process. So there's several medications in there. And as you work towards the center, the center of that wheel are drugs that are either now in the marketplace or imminently going to be in the marketplace. And they go from the outside of the wheel, which is phase one development, phase one trials, uh, to a final phase three trial, which will be a registry trial, which is the ones that I'll show you shortly, uh, define the efficacy of a product and prove beyond doubt to agencies like the FDA and TPP in Canada that this is a therapy that is, is uh, working and it probably should be uh, licensed for treatment. So there, there, there is lots of room at the front, so you can direct people up to the front. It's always amazing how the back row fills first in any one of these things. We don't pick on people in the front row. Um, and so if you look around, so there's groups, there's the interferons which we know about, they're the anti-proliferative drugs. These are drugs that block the lymphocytes from um, propagating themselves, of multiplying, because the more of these cells there are, the more disease there is if we can stop them from multiplying. There's even an ability to tolerize the body through even for, from something like a vaccination, where if you take a vaccine, you won't react against a certain bug, or you'll develop antibodies to protect you from that bug. You can tolerize yourself against the uh, uh, ill effects of MS and, and these types of techniques have been looked at for years. So, uh, this is forward. If that makes you dizzy, it makes me dizzy too because that's, that's the kind of pace that we're dealing with here. The relapsing remitting trials have also changed over the years. We've uh, now got the third rendition of the diagnostic criteria and every rendition has helped us by identifying patients who have MS even earlier. Now I, I look around the room and I see some, some uh, seasoned faces. So there's probably people who've had MS for, for a few years. And I want you to think back, and I want you to think back how long it took from the first symptom that you may have experienced to when someone finally figured it out that you had multiple sclerosis. And when I got into this business, the average was somewhere between five and seven years before someone twigged to the fact that, aha, you know what, I think that's MS. So now we can make a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis the day you show up with your first symptom. That's what the new criteria have allowed us to do. The last rendition still required a time component to allow you to develop new things over time to be sure that it was a multiple sclerosis. And that time could be important because during that time something else could have happened and you can't go back. 
So now we can diagnose literally on the day that someone presents with blindness. The new criteria allow us to be sure of a diagnosis of MS. And if we can be sure of a diagnosis of MS, unlike years back where we had nothing to offer, we have something to offer. <clears throat> and it turns out if you offer the treatments that have been around now for 20 years, but if you offer them early, they look a lot better than they did 20 years ago when the first patients went into an interferon trial. So getting these same medications in at an early stage makes the disease better. That's not rocket science. Think of cancer. If you can get at cancer very early, you can cure it. But if you let it run rampant, you're, you're best trying to just control it and, get, and buy some time. So the earlier you can nip it in the bud, so to speak, the better chances that you are for good survival. And I think we're starting to see this now in relapsing disease. The population that we're putting into clinical trials today, because we're diagnosing them much, much earlier, they're also not having the events as frequently as we would have had years ago. And I often joke to my colleagues, I say, if when we look at the results in the people who have taken placebo in today's trials, that would have been, that rate of attack would have been a dream for a treatment when we started our interferon trials. That, that, that would have been a miraculous treatment. Today we call it placebo because the rate of events is so low. And the rate of events is so low because we're now targeting a population very much earlier in the course of disease. And then over many years, people tend to do much better. And fewer people are seeming to evolve into this progressive phase because we caught it so early. So that's important. Now, you're going to hear about some pills. And everybody is sick and tired of injecting medicines. Although I had a patient today amazingly told me, don't show me a pill. I, don't, I hate pills. I said, okay, I won't show you a pill. But, uh, and she's very happy taking injections, doesn't want to have anything to do with pills. But most people don't like the idea of needles. And, and your, your thoughts are immediately, oh, that's an oral medicine, that's so much easier. And uh, I, that looks very attractive and I'd really like some of that. I, I just caution you because I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the data um, for the efficacy, but I'm also gonna point out some of the downsides. And probably the biggest downside I have to tell you about is that these medications are new. They've been used in a very select group of patients over the last probably 10 years even here in, in Ottawa. But they are selected. These patients are selected for having high activity early on and having no other medical problems that might cause a little bit of problem in a clinical study. That's not real life. Real life is that people tend to have more than one problem, and then we have to see how safe they are. We can look back now and, 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 and say all the bad things you want about interferon and glutarimer acetate. We've had them for nearly 20 years, but nobody's grown horns yet. This is a, these are safe medicines, and I don't know that we can say that yet about the new pills. So just keep that with, take that for a grain of salt. This is an interesting slide I put together of the compilation of trials over the years using interferons. And, and the, the, the columns are pointing out relapse rates. So the higher the bar, the worse the way the drug worked. And what do you notice as the bars go to the right are the decades in which the various trials have been performed. So in the, on the green bar, that's the, that's the drug Rebif. And if you look at the decade, it was from 1994 to 2007, look what's happening to the relapse rates that have been obtained with, Reb with Rebif. And what do you see? Is the drug getting better? Is this like a good wine and with age, they're just going to get better and better? Something else is happening, isn't it? Look at the next set of bars. That's the drug Avonex, or the last one, which is Betaseron or Extavia. And that's not unique to the interferons because we see exactly the same thing with glutarimer acetate. So why are these drugs getting so much better with time? 
Well, they're not. He knows the answer. Okay, they're not, he's not getting better. We're getting to patients earlier and earlier, and so they're able to produce much better results. So when you look at contemporary day trials and you just look at the numbers, the new pills look amazing. Because if you're going to compare them to the numbers that we got 20 years ago with interferon and glutirimer, they're going to look like those drugs don't work at all. And that's what you have to be careful about, because somebody wants to sell you a new drug, they're going to go, well, look at the comparison. You can't do that. And if you look at how the drugs did today, in at least a contemporary trial today, even the old tried and true injections are not looking so bad. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about some oral treatments. Teraflunamide, probably going to be called, and I don't know if this is going to be in Canada, Audagio. I don't know how these names get made up. BG12 does not yet have a name. It's called dimethylfumarate. That drug has been available as a generic in Germany for the last 20 years and costs pennies. So I have no idea what's going to happen when this drug, I'm not sure how different it is from the German product, but will probably cost thousands. So we're, we're, we're waiting to hear about that. I'll tell you briefly about liquinamod. Liquinamod um, probably will not come to market as a relapsing treatment, and you'll see why, but still holds promise in the way it may work for slowing progressive disease, and that needs to be tested. And then there's a slew of monoclonal antibodies, and you know how they're, they, you can always tell they're a monoclonal antibody because they always end in MAB, M-A-B, which stands for monoclonal antibody. Okay, so, and, and there's, there's lots of them. A lot that I haven't even put up here. There's been a, a whole slew of these used in cancer work. Uh, and, and again, I don't know who makes up these names. Uh, Alamtuzumab, Daclizumab, Ocrelizumab, Alphatumumab. I can tell you about Ustakinumab, but it hasn't been used uh, successfully. It's used more in psoriasis. And then there's Bephacisumab. And you know, the, you, what these are is if you see something that you think you can target, you can make a monoclonal against it and people are doing that. So like a very fine scalpel to the immune system, you can cut out just one step, and sometimes it's the most important one. Some of those agents have become extremely important in treatment of diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease. Uh, these are all other autoimmune diseases that not so dissimilar to, to MS, except they attack a different organ system. I won't talk about these two guys because they're still in phase two studies, so we're not going to see them. But uh, alemtuzumab has completed its phase three program, and daclizumab is well into its phase three program, so you may be hearing about it, and I thought I'd just show you some of the data. So the first one is teraflunamide. Teraflunamide has gone to Health Canada last summer. It will probably go back again this summer. Um, I, don't, I think it's a matter of dotting some I's and crossing some T's. The drug has been tested in our clinic for over a decade. Uh, our first study actually started, our study investigator meeting, everybody remembers around the world because it, was, it, it happened on 9-11, and when we, our coffee, uh, coffee break broke, we all went outside and they told us they had some TV set up for us to, to see something terrible. And we, we got out of the, uh, the room just in time to see the second plane hit the tower and everybody wondered, was that a replay? Uh, so everybody knows where we were on 9-11. That's where we were with a teraflunamide investigator meeting in Dublin, Ireland. So we weren't going home so fast either. Uh, but that's, that's how long we've been working on teraflunamide. Now, the, the parent drug for leflunamide is leflunamide. It's on the market for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, but had some liver problems. So they had to make a, 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 a uh, metabolite, which doesn't have met, uh, a metabol this type of, of, of liver problem. So that's teraflutamide, and I'll just show you the data from it. But I'm giving you the history because this tri clinical trial program took 10 years. Once it got to MS, for us to be proving beyond a doubt that it is effective for MS, that's how long it takes to develop the proper scientific research that will convince people that, that uh, this is not just a fly-by-night agent. 
And so the, the drug works as an anti-metabolite. It stops cells from proliferating by blocking an enzyme. And this enzyme knocks these cells out. And so if these were the bad guys, they're not going to proliferate. And they're not going to cross to the right side of your slide there, which is inside the brain, where it will meet up with myelin and possibly destroy it. So that's teraflunamide. And the first study, which was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine in, I think, January of this year, showed that if you took placebo, which tastes and smells exactly like the drug, and people don't know that they're taking the real drug or the placebo, so there's no unblinding, you can see that the relapse rate was substantially lower with both doses of teraflunamide. So that's the key primary outcome. But we never believe that a drug will work if it only affects one thing, because relapses are only one component of the disease. So we always break the uh, outcome measures into about three different things so that we can be sure of ourselves. And if all three of them are positive, then we're pretty convinced that there's been an effect of the drug. If only one of them is positive, then maybe we need to do some more work on this, because after all, you want it to reduce relapses. That's how we know we have a medicine that works on this inflammatory component. We also want to be sure that it's cutting down the number of lesions that develop on the MRI, because many of the MRI lesions are silent. And we know that if you do MRI sequentially, you can see how fast lesions develop. So the rate of development of MRI lesions is one of the outcome measures. And then ultimately, people are examined regularly through these trials. And we use something called an EDSS scale to see how, f uh, how people, um, all the signs and everything add up into some form of disability. And that's the rating scale that we use. And if, and if it doesn't slow down the development of the EDSS scale, then we're also not terribly convinced that the drug works. So here you see its effect on relapse rate. And this is not a huge study. This is several hundred patients in each arm, which isn't terrible. And then this is the time. It, it, this is an important curve because it, we, if it takes two years before you start to see the effect, then that's a drug that may be used differently than one you can see within a few months. And that, that's, that's actually the x-axis there is weeks. And so the question is, that gray curve, which is the placebo, how fast is it separating from the treatment curve? And you can see probably within 12 to 24 weeks, you're already seeing the treatment effect. So it's a fairly rapid onset. And then this is the EDSS progression. And probably by 48 to 60 weeks, certainly within the first year, you're starting to see these uh, curves deviate. And by the second year, the patients who have been taking this teraflunamide pill have a slower development of progression compared to the placebo. In terms of the MRI, you can see the curve that's developing the MRI lesions the fastest is at the top. That's the placebo. And interestingly, this is another way of assuring ourselves that we have a true treatment effect. The middle curve is the low dose, and the, and the bottom curve is, in fact, the high dose. And so there's a dose response in an individual. That's also very scientific, telling us that, that if you take twice as much, you're getting twice the effect. And so right across these three activity measures, we can be assured that teraflutamide is an effective treatment for relapsing disease. And this is the, the effects on the enhancing lesions. You know, sometimes we give dye uh, to look at which lesions actually light up. They're the ones that are fresh, that they've been formed in the last four weeks. And you can see those fresh lesions are being hit by this drug. Now, there is an element of safety. We thought that it would be a lot worse. Leflunamide, the parent drug, has actually been black boxed by the FDA. And what that means is that when they release the drug, there's a big warning, a big black box warning to doctors saying, watch out for, in this case, it's the liver. And uh, we were looking very hard for any kind of liver toxicity, and we didn't see it. In fact, there were some minor elevations in liver enzymes, and that's about it. Probably the only thing that stood out in this trial that people reported a little bit more than the placebo was hair thinning. And as I tell my colleagues, they're not going to get a lot of sympathy from me on that one. Tenier is an interesting study. We haven't seen this published yet, but it's an important one. And the, and the European authorities have taken 
a little bit of a step forward compared to the Americans and even the Canadians. They've said, as you do these trials, you better give us some idea of the perspective that this particular agent holds relative to what you're taking today. So how would this drug fare compared to people who are taking interferon or glutaramer? Because if we're gonna license it and let you sell it, people need to know. And so you have to do some kind of a comparator study. And that's what is being required of them because as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the event rate is so low that when you save, take somebody who's having 0.4 attacks a year, that's like one attack every two to three years, and you drop them to 0.2 attacks a year, which is one attack every five years or 10 years, you're going, so what? That's a very mild effect. Show me something else. Give me something more for it. And so they want to see how it's done towards to a comparator. This study was actually designed to do one step further. This is what's not called an efficacy study. This is called an effectiveness study. Now, what's the difference? Well, drugs are only effective if you can take them. Seems rather logical. If you don't take the drug, you don't get the benefit, but it's surprising how many people have tolerance problems to the drugs and, and are forced to stop taking them or cannot take them the way they've been prescribed to take. So it's not going to be an effective therapy if you can't stay on the therapy. And so this is what this effectiveness trial was all about. You compare the two doses of teraflitamide, in this case, to Rebif, a high-dose interferon, which has had a great track record, and ask the question, can you see a difference? And the end point is, at two years, who has not had an event, such as an attack, or who's still on their drug? Because if you have to stop your drug, then you're not going to get to two years and get the benefit. And so this is going to be um, presented, actually. This is data hasn't been presented yet. Uh, so you're getting a little glimpse of it. It'll be at the Ectrams meeting this year. When you look at the annualized relapse rate, now, this is a comparator study. No one expected teraflutamide to do as well as it did. But in fact, the 14 milligram dosage didn't look that different from Rebif. And when you look at the effectiveness, there were a lot fewer people stopping the pills than there were stopping the injections. And so at the end of the two years, you could almost say that the, the pill was a winner, although statistically it didn't come out superior. But it certainly didn't come out inferior. And so compared to the interferon, uh, teraflunamide is probably going to hold its own. And, and so the, the big issue here was there were more tolerability issues with interferon. Now there's another interesting study that we've done and there's actually a phase three study right now recruiting patients because uh, actually I was involved in, in getting uh, the company to add this drug to interferon. So we convinced them to do this for safety purposes so that you can see if you added one to the other as people might do for a little while just to see that they're tolerant and then they'll stop the injection, you'd want to know that the two were compatible. So we did an early study of just an add-on and in fact there were no safety signals came up whatsoever and when the company sent the data to me because I was the uh, principal investigator of the study for, for the world actually, I looked at the data and I called them up and I said, wow, did you see this? And they said, yeah, it's really safe. And I said, no, you missed it. This was the study. You take people who are on interferon or glutamate acetate, they're on it, they're on it stable, they're happy, they're not having any events whatsoever. You take them and you add the drug or you add a placebo and you just do monthly MRIs on them and see how they're doing. Well, that's what I saw. And then finally I had to open the eyes of the company and said, look, the, uh, the gray bar are the people who are taking interferon and are happy with it. They're not having any events, but if you, do an, if you do an MRI every month, about half the scans had at least one enhancing lesion. So there's always amongst the two uh, medicines that we have. So you have a modest effect with interferon, you have a modest effect with teraflutamide, and you put them together and you get a major effect. That's the hypothesis, and I finally convinced them to do the study, which is now recruiting around the world in a phase three of an add-on to interferon. 
Because if teraflutamide comes in priced at a reasonable rate, putting it together with interferon is a, is a viable alternative to the switching to, say, some of the more expensive drugs that will carry more risk. So that's intriguing. And the same effect was seen, but to a lesser extent, with uh, glutaramer acetate. This was not a powered study to look at relapse. They're very small numbers, but look at the trend. The gray bar are the people who are only taking the interferon, and then you see a dose response on reducing the relapse rate the more interiflunamide you took on top of the interferon. So I think these add-on studies are giving us some promise, and it's, le it's, it's the first combination uh, trial that, that I know of that is showing a true efficacy. So that's something to consider. Now, there was a lot of hype about BG12 because it's this dimethyl fumarate that was used for the treatment of psoriasis in Germany. And, uh, well, I, I ha this is the mechanism, but you, very, very few of you probably know anything about these genes, so I'm just going to skip all that. The phase two trial was rather anticlimactic and not particularly enthusiastic. It was only the drug, the very high dosage on the far right, that had to be taken three times daily before you saw an effect. Um, and so nobody expected what we saw in the, in the phase two trial. There was no effect almost on relapse rate at all in the phase two, which was a six-month trial. But when you looked at the two-year trial, there was a very clear effect of both doses of BG12 and uh, even slowing EDSS progression. But we saw this, this uh, difference. If that's 24 weeks, you're starting to see the, the drug uh, have an effect. But on EDSS progression, it looks like it's taken almost more than a year before the drug starts to work. So it looks like it takes a little longer to get the effect. Um, plus, you have to take it twice a day, at least, to get the effect. Uh, and the effect on driving down the MRI is very much there. So this is a, another way of, of proving that BG12 is effective. They've done a second trial we just heard about a week ago called CONFIRM this time with an active comparator, which was glutyramer acetate. And the numbers show you that glutyramer works, but it looks like BG12 in the same population had a bit of a better effect. So at least relative to the uh, glutyramer acetate, BG12 was effective, and the effect that one could measure is a little bit higher. Uh, you probably can't even read that, but these are the common, common adverse events that are, are seen with BG12. BG12 is, it produces what's called a niacin effect. Uh, niacin makes you flush. Uh, for, for the women in here who are old enough, it basically gives you the feeling of menopause. Not sure that that's a particularly good feeling, uh, but uh, for the men, I guess uh, you'll appreciate what your wives are going through. Uh, and so this is gonna be a tolerability issue, and plus you have to take the medicine at least twice a day, which uh, may be a detraction for some people. Liquinimod was, is a, another product, completely different mechanism of action. Uh, it was derived from a medicine that we tried years ago called linamide, which was quite toxic and had to be, the study had to be stopped. Uh, but the, the idea of going after that particular niche of the immune system was still a good one, and liquinimod was developed. So it too had a, 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 an important trial where they compared it to uh, uh, one dose to, to a placebo. And the effect was there, and it was measurable, but it was modest. And as you can see here that the numbers uh, don't really bear big changes. Uh, but nevertheless, with enough patients, the p-value, which is the chances that this happened by chance alone, are less than 2.5%. It's usually less than 5% you, uh, you believe that the drug is actually working. Um, there was a slowing of uh, EDSS progression but it was also modest. And there was an effect on reducing MRI activity, and in some cases it wasn't even significant, but it's certainly not to the same levels that we've seen with the other two products. So it doesn't look like this drug is terribly good for inflammatory forms of MS, but it looks like it was slowing progression and it also slowed something called brain atrophy, and so it has gone back to the table and is being considered for progressive disease. There were really no safety issues at all with liquidamide. It was extremely well tolerated for people, uh, almost uh, no side effects beyond the ones that you'd probably see listed on the bottle of aspirin. They did a comparator study with interferon, 
And uh, you can see that the interferon is effective, and so is liquinamide. And, and so, that, so it's holding its own against at least the, uh, the low-dose interferon. Uh, the, the effect on progression was not significantly different from, from uh, interferon. The top line here is the, uh, is the placebo. Okay. We're going to get into one of the MABs, and, uh, and then I'll try to sum this up. Alemtizumab is actually an incredibly potent agent. Uh, we've been fortunate to be involved with both programs, and maybe some of the patients here have actually been participating in that program. It was very enticing because even though this product, uh, my colleague Harry Atkins, who's a hematology, uh, oncology specialist, he's afraid of this drug. This is a drug that's used for bone marrow conditioning before you would have a bone marrow transplant. So it's very potent. You take a series of infusions for a week or two, and you're good for a year. And then the second year, you take two or three infusions, and you're good for another year. Now, they've got five-year follow-up from patients from a first study who may have only taken one set of infusions, and they've had no other therapies for five years, and they seem to be doing well. However, there's always uh, no free lunch with some of these drugs, and so you have to consider some of the important side effects. So there were two major programs that were involved with alemtizumab. Um, the CARAMS-1 and CARAMS-2 programs, the first one was against placebo. Sorry. The first one was in naive patients who had never taken a therapy before. The second one was in patients who were on a therapy but continued to relapse. There's no placebo. This is how potent this drug is. You didn't need a placebo. They took on Rebif. Rebif is the comparator. And the numbers here, you're going to look, it's going to look like a placebo-controlled study. That's how much better alemtuzumab is than interferon. So this is the, uh, the model of the study. The top line being the Rebif injections, that's why there's so many crosshatches, compared to the alemtuzumab on the bottom line where there's just a few at the beginning and another few in year two, at the beginning of year two. And that's the kind of difference they saw here between zero and two. You can see nearly a 55% reduction in relapse over, the re uh, over Rebif. So the same kinds of numbers that we were seeing against placebo we're seeing against the high-dose interferon. You can see how fast this, this uh, therapy works. Those curves are moving apart almost immediately, and they stay apart at two years. When you look at uh, the six-month disability, the first study uh, didn't show a difference. Now, people say, oh, well, it didn't show a difference. I said, yeah, but you're throwing it against an active comparator, which is Rebif. So all you're confirming here is that Rebif works but you haven't exceeded that ability at two years because disability is slowly progressing. Well, I can tell you that in the second study, they did. This is the, the effect on, on residual enhancements. Rebif is a very strong drug at cutting down MRI activity. Even so, the alemtuzumab was that much better. Uh, and this is just looking again at the, at the MRI activity. Now, the, the downside of this drug is that it is so potent that when it really upsets the way the immune system redevelops. And believe it or not, there's an emergence of what we call another autoimmune disease in about 40% of people. That autoimmune disease is usually thyroid, which already has a high coincidence with multiple sclerosis, but is manageable in almost 100% of people. And most of the patients who've developed hyper or hypothyroidism they're, they're not treated with iodine or anything. They're given a, a, a medicine that will endure for probably three to six months, and then they're almost all taken off of it. So it's, it's a manageable problem. In the first study, somebody died from a, um, a hemorrhage because he didn't show up for his routine appointments, and they, didn't, uh, they, they weren't able to ascertain that he actually had an antibody to one of his clotting factors, another problem with this drug. With proper monitoring in both of these studies now going on six to seven years, they've never seen another case of so-called ITP, which led to the hemorrhage. So this is not a, a therapy. It's a therapy that leaves you free of taking any medicines, but requires fairly intensive monitoring 
to be sure that everybody is safe on it. So I can just assure you that, that that's what it requires. So here's the thyroid disorders. Um, hyperthyroid, very common, uh, emerges in many of the people uh, following this therapy. And then, then the second therapy was like, this is in patients who actually are having problems while interferon. And that's an interesting one because that's likely where this drug is going to go. And in this particular group, it was even more potent and now did show an effect on disability. So alemtuzumab, not likely to be your first line therapy for MS, but a very potent second go-to should you have breakthrough disease that is quite worrisome. Uh, and that's the top line results, which you can look at another time. I'm just going to briefly tell you about daclizumab because I was actually kind of surprised at this data. Uh, this is the first time it was actually tested in, in, against placebo. This is a drug that, that um, targets a molecule that, that uh, the T cells and lymphocytes use to stimulate themselves to propagate. So you're really catching them very early and you're stopping any kind of proliferation. It sounds like it should work. The danger was that all the good guys that we have in our immune system also use the same signal. And the fear was that you're going to take out too many of the good guys with the bad guys, and then you're going to end up with some new problems. We actually didn't see it. Daclizumab was ridiculously easy to tolerate. Against placebo, it had the same kind of measured eff effectiveness. It only needs to be taken once a month, so that's an attraction to it. It could probably be even given less than that, but they haven't tested the dosage. But you can see very good uh, separation of these curves almost immediately, where the placebo is the lowest line here, so it's having all the events. The other group, uh, the two lines on the top, are free of those events. And here you can see the, the proportion that are uh, enduring in the EDSS progression. They're more in the placebo. So this was a surprise promising agent that uh, was actually developed down in the NIH. Um, with, a, with a colleague who's now, uh, who, who's really pushing the agenda on, I give him a lot of credit for it, it's uh, Dr. Greg Blevins, and he's now out in Edmonton uh, running the MS Center there. So Canadians at the heart of a lot of trials. Uh, promising results on GATO. So I just want to throw some numbers up here just so that you're not all uh, staggered. You can see all of these new therapies, and the important thing is not to look at these relative numbers because they really, uh, will, they're good for selling drug. What you really have to look at is what the benefit is to you, and that's where I'm about to unreveal here. This is the absolute difference in relapse rate. So 0.5 a year is one attack every two years. That's the absolute effect of these drugs, and if you look across there, especially at the, the second last one, lequinamide, look at the relapse rate reduction. So you're paying a lot of money for a drug that does very little, even though it's statistically significant. When you look at the uh, effects across the MRI, that's the third column, uh, sorry, third row, they're all pretty good except for liquinamide. And then again, that's the drug that I was telling you is probably going to go for progressive disease. But when you look at the absolute numbers of reduced disability, again, you're going to see very small numbers, and that's reflecting the population that we're studying today, which over the course of two years, very few people progress, even those who don't take anything. So it's a, a low rate because we're going into patients much earlier. It gets that much harder to prove that drugs are truly effective. There's lots of, uh, 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 of hype about the new medications. They may be better than, than, uh, than the old ones. We have uh, to use a lot more patients to prove statistical significance. But we're going to also deal with problems we've never had with interferon and glutamine. These are going to be much more complicated to give. They bring to the table new problems and toxicities. So even though there's an attraction of a little pill or a little capsule, um, they're, they're much more complex. And the average neurologist, I can tell you, is shying away from using some of these, which requires the, the uh, uh, efforts of, a, of, a, of a, a tertiary clinic like ours, where we were all trained to use these medications where your people are going to get them. Now, I haven't forgotten the progression. And, and, and I'm really happy to put up this last slide because virtually all the new trials that we're doing are focused on progressive disease. I think what I just showed you is just a tad of what's going on for relapsing. That tool chest is full. I think we'll be able to deal with relapsing disease very well today, anyone who shows up with it, 
this is a great time for them. Well, what about the poor people who have already had the progression? Have we forgotten about them? The answer is no, we haven't. That challenge is the next one for us. And every single trial that we've been taking on here in Ottawa focuses now on progressive disease. And I'm just listing the ones here for you. These are the ones that are, are either recruiting now, have recruited, or are going to recruit. So Fingolimod for primary progressive MS, fully recruited and, and cooking. That Fingolimod's the newest tablet that just got approved by Health Canada last year. Natalizumab. Uh, a treatment for relapsing disease may have some promise in secondary progressive disease. We are recruiting for that study now. Sipinimod, similar to Fingolimod, an S1P receptor agonist. Well, uh, you don't even know what I'm talking about. That's okay. These are, these are molecules that are, are working at a, a different level in the immune system. They also are, that same receptor happens to be on the cell that makes myelin. So it may be possible to stimulate the cell to make more myelin. So that's in, in, in a planning stage. We hope to have a, a protocol by the end of the year. Ocrelizumab for both relapsing and primary progressive, currently recruiting at our clinic. Antilingo 1, lingo is an inhibitor of myelin making cells to proliferate. If you block it, they start to make themselves more and they might repair. There's two studies about to start here in Ottawa and worldwide. One looking specifically at vision, at optic neuritis, the other in secondary progressive MS. And then finally, T-Celna, which is a T-cell vaccination product made by a company called OPEXA. It takes your own cells, raises them against certain myelin proteins that you may be reactive to. They create cell lines that are then used for a vaccination, and they bring them back to the individual. So you are the maker of your own T-cell vaccine and it's repeated in a year. Protocols there, we actually had our initiation visit today. We hope to be recruiting patients by the summer. All of these focused on progressive MS. So I think I can leave you with truly this slide that tells us that the future for therapy is very promising. And thank you very much for your attention.